Our body mm -hmm. adapts mm -hmm. to stress and resistance training is a form of stress. If you don't have that primary anabolic sort of signal there, it doesn't matter how much protein you consume, you're not going to get stronger. Mm. Should they be choosing food over a protein shake? A protein shake's bad? What's your view on this? I don't think protein shakes are bad. This idea that protein powders are processed, therefore they must be bad. There are a lot of foods that are processed that are not healthy, mm. but we have to be careful just one putting everything into the same bucket because they don't have the same characteristic. The only time where I think they could be problematic is if when you're thinking about protein, especially plant-based protein, how should we be mapping it? The most optimal time for protein is the first protein intake of the day. Other people <laughs> completely disagree with that concept. What's your view on how should we be looking at our protein throughout the day? My view on this has changed a little bit. I probably thought previously it was more important to have these equal doses of 25 to 35 grams of protein, four or five times a day. To be honest, five years ago, that's what everyone was saying. And now I would say. I'm your host, Sarah Ann Macklin, and I'm on a mission to uncover the maze of health myths around nutrition and wellbeing and guide you through my seven pillars of health. Join me on a journey of discovery and connection and pull up a pew for a front row seat to the most exclusive health conversations of our time. Welcome to Live Well, Be Well. If you've watched one episode and enjoyed it, I'd love to ask in agreement for you to subscribe to the show. Subscribing is such a small thing, but gives so much exposure to this show, bringing bigger guests, bigger production, and more that we can deliver each week to more people. Every time you subscribe, it shows me that you enjoy the content. So if you do me a favor, and if you've enjoyed the show, please press subscribe. Simon, welcome to Live Well Be Well. Thank you so much for being here. Sarah, it's a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. So I am very excited to talk to you about a whole load of things today, actually. Having you on, I think you have such a plethora of knowledge, which spans across so many different areas. So trying to bring this into something that was quite specific was quite hard. But I thought we'd start off on something that's really topical. We talk about quite a lot recently on the show and it's had a lot of interest and it's around protein and plant-based protein versus meat-based protein. And especially when it comes to, which we haven't delved into too much, strength and performance. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of that overarching old star opinion that you've got to eat a ton of meat to gain good quality muscle and skeletal health. Now, can you talk to me a little bit about plant-based protein in regards to strength and performance and how should we be looking at it? Do we need more than if we're mm -hmm. not having meat and kind of what's the context of this currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a topic that I've kind of dug into at great depths with a number of different <laughs> researchers from uh, you know Christopher Gardner and Volta Longo and Don Lehman. These will be names that people might uh, be familiar with. Um, there's well, a there's a few things to, recently, okay. right? So yeah. you've had you've had Chris on. He's he's a mm -hmm. delight to speak to. A really fun guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a few things that we need to kind of break down here to make this really simple for yes. for the listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's often said is that plant proteins are are incomplete and we need everyone to understand what the definition of incomplete is because mm -hmm. that's often conflated with plants missing an essential amino acid as in mm -hmm. they're just not there mm -hmm. and just to kind of define essential amino acid that is a building block of protein that your body cannot make some amino mm -hmm. acids that our body uses to make protein we can make they're non-essential mm -hmm. and then the essential ones we have to get through our diet. So mm -hmm. there's this idea out there that certain plants like types of legumes like black beans or whole grains that the protein in those is incomplete and people conflate that with, okay, it's missing an essential amino acid. It's actually one of the nine essential amino acids or more is not there. Mm -hmm. That's actually inaccurate. It's a myth. All plants, contain all nine essential amino acids okay i'll repeat that mike drop. all plants every single plant contains all nine essential amino acids that's where they come from right animals mm -hmm. also don't produce these 
themselves. They have to get it from somewhere. So these are these are, amino acids originate in plant form, and all mm-hmm. plants have all nine. What is true is that in certain plants, if you look at the amount of these amino acids, if you were to eat just that food, so let's take let's take uh, grains as an example here. If you were to just eat grains for all of your calories, so let's say someone's eating 2,000 calories a day. <laughs> Gosh, you'd and, be bored. And, and I say, okay, you're only going to eat brown rice. Now you're going to fall into a little bit of trouble here because you'll fall short of your daily requirement for one of those essential amino acids, which is lysine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not that lysine is not in in grains it's just that if you were to eat all of your calories from grains you wouldn't get enough lysine Mm -hmm. but that that is important so that's the definition of an incomplete protein if you were to essentially get all of your calories from that food would you get all nine essential amino acids that's important in the context of a diet where there is not a great deal of diversity little to no diversity so perhaps in developing countries Mm. Um, whereas when you are eating with just modest diversity, what ends up happening is some of the foods that you're eating, yeah, they might be a little low in lysine, but other foods are high in lysine. And Mm -hmm. anyone can run this exercise if you were, I mean, if we take this to the full extreme and think of a diet that has no animal protein, it's completely plant exclusive, put it, Mm -hmm. go use the app uh, chronometer and just put a day of eating into that. And it breaks down the nine essential amino acids. And you'll mm-hmm. see if you're eating sufficient calories mm. and you're eating you know, sufficient total protein for the day, which we can come to, and I want to yeah. come to, then all, you'll get all of your nine essential amino acids in spades. You know, most of them will be like two, 300% of what you actually require on, on a daily basis. Uh, so the, the main most important message here is that plants are not missing these essential amino acids. If you eat enough total energy and total protein, then you will get enough of the nine essential amino acids that are important for building muscle, building strength, hormone production, collagen production, all the things that we need amino acids for. Mm -hmm. And someone might say, okay, but are they as bioavailable? Are they as digestible? Mm -hmm. Really good question. Great question. Um, and I understand why people think this because that's a, that's another thing that comes up. It's well, yeah, plants may have protein, but can your body actually absorb and utilize that as well as animal protein that doesn't mm-hmm. have anti nutrients and fiber and things that could reduce amino acid bioavailability? Um, so there's there's a couple of uh, things to to really consider here. There is evidence that animal protein is more bioavailable than plant protein. Mm -hmm. What is that evidence? Well, the bulk majority of that evidence is from rats and pig studies. Mm -hmm. And the the pig studies are considered the most reliable because the digestive tract of pig is very similar to a human. Mm -hmm. The main problem with these studies is in almost all of these studies, and Christopher Gardner brought this to my attention, he's written a paper on this, is that in almost all of those those studies, they fed the, the animals raw plant protein. And so when you feed raw grains and raw uh, legumes, for example, it's no wonder that the bioavailability is lower. We know that soaking and cooking these foods sort of liberates nutrients and makes them more bioavailable. And in the very, very small number of studies that have looked at actual bioavailability differences between animal and plant protein when prepared Mm -hmm. as you and I and the listeners would eat these foods. Mm -hmm. It it says in this paper, and I'll share it with you, the differences are probably only a few percent. And so we've overestimated, likely we've overestimated. Now, granted, there isn't a lot of data here. So it's not like every single Mm. plant protein has been tested against every single animal protein. Um, But what I would say is that it seems we've probably overestimated differences in bioavailability. And, mm-hmm. and then I would say, well, why don't we go to studies looking at randomized controlled trials where we split people into two groups and 
again, take this to the extreme, have one group who only gets their protein from plants and the other group that gets their protein from a mix of animal proteins and plants as you would see in a kind of typical omnivorous diet. Mm -hmm. And, and let's, let's match total protein. Let's put total protein. Remember before I said, as long as you're getting enough total protein, these, it mm -hmm. probably doesn't make a difference. Let's match total protein. Let's get that to 1.6 grams per kilogram, which is okay. probably that lower threshold, lower threshold of what we would say is an ideal target if you're trying to really optimize for hypertrophy, which is muscle growth and strength. Okay, whether mm -hmm. you're a recreational or a professional athlete, there are contexts where you might want more than that. We can go into it. But we now have several of these studies, at least in healthy adults. Uh, I believe one of the papers was men and women, and the other paper I'm thinking of here was just men, um, where they get these adults, one group's eating only plant protein, the other group is getting a mix of animal and plant protein, put it at 1.6 grams per kilogram, put them both mm -hmm. through resistance training protocols, mm -hmm. and over the course of eight to 12 weeks, measure any differences in muscle growth, strength, et cetera. And you do not see any significant differences. So what, what I would kind of throw back to someone that wanted to kind of push back on um, plants being incomplete or complete or bioavailability is to say, well, what do you really care about? Do you really mm -hmm. care about the, the percentage of a particular amino acid in a food? Or do you care about things like hypertrophy and strength, actual health outcomes, because I know what I'm most interested in. It's, it's the mm -hmm. outcomes like those, like how are we going to reduce our risk of sarcopenia? Um, Wait. and then, mm -hmm. and then to kind of broaden that, which is where my message differs to some people like Peter Atiyah or Lane Norton is that I personally, and this is the philosophy I adopted in my, my own life is I want to stay vital, strong, um, I want to be able to navigate my environment, be at low risk of fractures as I'm aging, but I also want to be at low risk of cardiometabolic um, disease. And mm -hmm. we have quite significant data that consistently shows swapping calories from animal protein for plant protein is a good way to reduce the risk of certain cardiometabolic diseases. So my kind of overall thesis is that I think, you know, leaning more towards plant protein it doesn't have to be exclusive but the average diet right now is 85 percent of protein is coming from animal sources mm. um, wow, i think we can much. we can i think we can tilt that and even if you just get it 50 50 mm. that's some good substitutions that are occurring and you will be able to still perform get those strength hypertrophy results you're looking for but at the same time optimize your cardio metabolic risk factors and, mm -hmm. and you know i think the way I look at it is you're kind of getting the, the best of both worlds there. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about protein, especially plant-based protein, how should we be mapping it in terms of our performance and exercise, especially strength and resistance training? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's a really confusing landscape. Some people say the most optimal time for protein is the first protein intake of the day. Other people <laughs> completely disagree with that concept. And so like the space of this, especially this one, topical concept is huge and it is mm. so confusing so what's your view on how mm. should we be looking at our protein throughout the day and my view on this has changed a little bit and there's been some recent mm. research looking at protein distribution and muscle protein synthesis um you know i probably thought previously it was more important to have these kind of equal doses of 25 to 35 grams of protein four or five times a day um, yeah to be honest, about now, five years ago, that's what everyone was saying. And now I would say, I'm, I still think distribution matters, mm. but total protein intake is what really matters. You just have okay. to give your body the total sort of pool of amino acids over mm -hmm. a 24 hour period. And mm -hmm. that's by far and away the most critical factor. So if your target is hundred grams per day of protein, just make sure you're getting that. Like, let's keep it simple. There could mm. be some extra benefits that are up for grabs. Maybe if you were to kind of space that out and have four meals of 25 grams versus one meal of 100 grams. But I'm starting to think that might not be so important. Okay. 
So you're saying as long as you can just get it in, it doesn't actually matter too much about the distribution. Right, there was, there was this idea that anything over 25, 30 grams of protein is wasted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're starting to learn that that's, that's not accurate. It's not that if you consume over 30 grams in a single meal that the body excretes the excess amino acids or that they don't um, stick around and help with building of muscle um, later on in that 24 hour period. I, I think they do. Um, and so, yeah, I would say don't get caught up too much in the distribution of protein. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, there are some other reasons for having protein at every meal other than just muscle hypertrophy. So I don't want to kind of get too caught in the weeds here. Distribution, I think, matters from um, the perspective of satiety mm -hmm. um, and also pra mm -hmm. being practical. Like, is someone going to get 100 grams of protein in one meal? <laughs> so um, I was trying to vision that when you said it to me. I was like, yeah. how much? How much would they have to eat in one sitting to get that? Quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, I've probably confused the listeners here a little bit. I guess what I'm what I'm saying in terms of your, if you go to the gym, you do resistance training, um, and you want to recover and get the, you know, actually provide the body with the nutrition it needs to take mm -hmm. that stimulus and lay down new muscle tissue and, and grow stronger. Just getting enough protein in a 24 hour period is really, really what matters most. Mm -hmm. Because there was also that other argument about having too much protein can also be not beneficial for you. And so there's kind of two very distinct camps here. Um, yeah, so what do you think the answer is on that? Can we have too much protein in one sitting? Is it gonna harm us? I've had some debates on this on my show. Mm. Uh, I've had Volta Longo on, who's a little bit more of the low protein camp. I've had Don Lehman on, who is more of a high protein camp. Then I've had Chris Gardner and Stuart Phillips, who I'd say kind of are sitting more towards the middle yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, I think the data on like protein restriction being good for longevity is pretty weak <laughs> and it's mm. it's pretty flimsy when you actually dig deep into it a lot of it's animal or rodent data um, mm -hmm. these animals are living in caged environments they're they don't have to be strong and agile and navigating the environment like we do out in the wild mm -hmm. um, they don't need a really robust immune system protein is very important for immunity because they're mm -hmm. in a sterile condition um, they're mm. not sort of exposed to other uh, biology. Um, and the sort of very, very kind of, I'd say, weak human data that we have, observational data that low protein is, uh, is associated with reduced mortality and cancer incidents. You have to remember that the, this study is looking at the average American who's not doing any, really no resistance training. They're mm -hmm. obese. There's, um, you know, inflammatory sort of milieu. And yeah, maybe in that environment, if someone's not exercising and is significantly overweight and is inflamed, then just throwing a whole lot of extra protein into that environment is probably mm -hmm. not great. Mm. Um, but we have, the studies that have looked at what happens to so you know growth hormones like IGF one, which is you know people often say protein spikes IGF one, it increases cancer. Um, what I would say to people is protein's effect on IGF one and sort of chronic levels of IGF one seems to be determined by whether or not you're actually exercising. And there's studies that have looked at that. And so you feed people protein that are not exercising and look at IGF one 24 hours later feed people protein plus get them to resistance train, look at IGF-1 24 hours later. And when they have the resistance training stimulus there, IGF-1 does not go up. Uh, so I would say, I don't think people need to fear protein. I think mm -hmm. um, certainly if you are going to optimize for protein, first you want to optimize your exercise, which means mm -hmm. resistance training and doing resistance training uh, properly, effectively, mm -hmm. probably a better mm -hmm. word. There are some principles for people to think about there, um, such that that protein is actually being put to to good use. Mm -hmm. And should people have protein before working out? I think that's another big question that we got asked after our last kind of protein conversation on the show. Mm. I don't think it matters that much if they've eaten enough protein the day before. Okay. I don't think so, we have a lot of data to suggest that, you know, you need to, to, to kind of scull 
uh, mm. uh, a protein shake before you go into the gym. But what about a protein shake after? Because there's a lot of conversation mm. about protein shakes being good, protein shakes being bad. Do we need protein shakes? Should we not be getting it from our food? Like, what's your, for the kind of optimal way, and that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, if people, mm -hmm. should they be choosing food? over a protein shake a protein shake's bad what's your view on this because it's, it's a big, i don't think protein shakes market. are bad i don't okay. think they're bad i think they have their place you know someone needs to look at let's say for example someone wants to target 1.6 grams per kilogram of protein mm -hmm. um and i don't know let's say that their total protein intake is 90 grams per day mm -hmm. that person might be completely fine getting that protein from whole foods mm -hmm. but then let's say someone else who is a bigger person has to get 150 160 170 grams of protein per day it's a different context um mm. you're asking that person to eat a lot of fiber or, or you know just a lot of total food volume and protein powders can be convenient and they can be a good way to get that extra protein in when you're already feeling quite full from other foods Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's this this idea that protein powders are processed, therefore they must be bad. Um, and I think that falls into a kind of appeal to nature fallacy that mm -hmm. just because something isn't found in nature, it isn't it must be bad. and 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 I'm not I, there are a lot of foods that are processed that are not healthy, mm -hmm. but we have to be careful just not putting everything into the same bucket because they don't have the same mm -hmm. characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, and I and so, I, I see very little harm from from protein powders. Um, the The only time where I think they could be problematic is if you're getting, you know, almost all of your protein from them. Then, mm. what that's displacing from the diet is a lot of protein rich foods that come with a lot of vitamins and minerals and fiber, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're displacing a lot of these foods by just trying to get all your protein from protein powder i wouldn't suggest that i'd suggest it as kind of just like a top up just getting you to that um, optimal protein target making it a little bit easier but mm -hmm. not sort of over relying on it like i i would have like probably 30 to 40 grams of protein from protein powder a day myself and my target where i would land is 150 160 grams okay and it, I mean, there is that there is that thing of just looking at the protein powder you're buying because there's just so much on the market and seeing actually what is the simplest form that you can buy that might not be full mm. of. The, the story that I heard recently was someone was really struggling to sleep and because they were working out in the evening and their protein powder had so much caffeine in. They just had no mm. idea. And so for <sighs> yeah. them, that was like, I just said, <laughs> have the protein powder, but just choose one without caffeine. And it's just that kind mm. of simplistic messaging that sometimes we just don't actually look at the back and think, mm. probably not appropriate for my evening workout. But it's, it's interesting, like how we can become quite unaware of what are in the products that we're buying. I think that's kind of a really big talking point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done that myself, actually. I remember being <laughs> in Bali and... I, I bought this tub of protein over there um, and it's like it was like a pre-workout protein I'd never mm -hmm. seen that before I'm not sure why they actually did that crazy and I didn't read it clearly and <laughs> had that right before bed and literally didn't get, <laughs> didn't get any sleep at all so that's that was terribly frustrating but you know now I use it the, the thing that I look for on protein now is mm -hmm. I, I want roughly 30 grams in a protein shake that I'm going to have 30 grams of protein and I like mm -hmm. when brands list the amino acid profile there is one thing mm -hmm. on there that I will look for I like to see at least 2,000 milligrams or 2 grams of leucine um, that mm -hmm. that is an important amino acid for supporting muscle protein synthesis so like now I'm using a brand in the US I'm not sure it's in the UK called Momentus um, mm -hmm. and that kind of has like 2.5 or 3 grams of, of leucine um for for 30 grams of protein the other thing sarah just quickly that i realized i didn't i, I kind of skipped over i just want to make something clear yeah uh the average protein intake in western countries kind of without people really thinking about it is mm -hmm. about 1.1 1 .1 to 1 1.2 grams per kilo mm -hmm. and you know that's a little bit debatable depending on which study you look at and also yeah the the type of diet someone's following. So as someone gets more plant-based, it is definitely true. Their total protein intake 
tends to go down a bit. In some studies, it's mm. more like one gram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, potentially if someone's eating that way, they need to focus a little more on the protein-rich plant foods mm. to, to consume the same amount as the average person that's eating an omnivorous diet for sure. Um, but there's this really interesting research that's looked at strength. And we know strength mm -hmm. is a really great predictor of mortality. And mm -hmm. it's looked at how does strength change with varying levels of protein intake in two mm -hmm. different contexts. So one is if you just increase protein and you're mm -hmm. not doing resistance training, what happens to strength? And so there's this beautiful graph. Good I'll share, you, share this with you. Well, you, you basically see nothing, right? So mm. as you can you can you can increase protein, but if the stimulus is not there, remember, like structure reflects function. Our body mm -hmm. adapts mm -hmm. to stress, and resistance mm -hmm. training is a form of stress. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that primary anabolic sort of signal there, it doesn't matter how much protein you consume. You're not going to get stronger. Mm. You're not going to mm -hmm. develop more lean tissue. And then what's really interesting is in the other graph, you'll see that, okay, now we look at people that are resistance training. What happens to strength as you increase protein? And what's really, really interesting here is that most of the strength gain is actually achieved at 1.2 grams per kilogram, which is the average intake of protein across society. There is a little bit, maybe like an extra 10, 15% getting from 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you could kind of squeeze out the last, you know, drips of water in that towel by doing mm -hmm. that. But what this says to me is, you know, why do we see so much sarcopenia and mm -hmm. loss of strength as people are aging? When the average intake is already at 1.2 grams per kilogram, and we know that at, by that point, as long as resistance training is there, that's where most of the strength is achieved, strength gain. Mm -hmm. And the reason is... 70 to 80 percent of people are not lifting there's there's a lack of the stimulus so i just want to point out to people that we often over focus on protein and get caught up on that but literally if, if most people didn't change their diet that much and mm -hmm. got resistance training in place and did it effectively um, mm -hmm. we would see significantly less sarcopenia Recent studies in the UK have shown a concerning trend. Nearly a third of Britons suffer with insomnia or severe sleep disturbances, with stress, screens and sleep hygiene largely to blame. This isn't just about feeling groggy in the morning. The NHS has linked poor sleep with a high risk in chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity and not to mention the impact on poor mental health. That's why I'm excited to share with you my experience with Naturomat, a company that truly understands the science of sleep. Crafted in Devon with its organic, renewable materials, Naturomat mattresses are a testament to what it means to sleep naturally. Unlike the common mattresses that trap heat and moisture, Naturomat's use of organic wool and coconut fiber ensures your body remains at a comfortable temperature throughout the night, promoting a more deeper, restorative night's sleep. But what really sets Naturomat apart is their commitment to sustainability. As the UK's first B Corp certified bed and mattress company, they're not just talking about environmental responsibility, they're living it. From their solar powered workshops to their groundbreaking Mattress for Life initiative, choosing Naturomat is a choice for a healthier planet. I personally visited Naturomat's showroom in Chiswick and I was amazed at their sleep zone. It's designed to give you a real sense of how their mattresses can transform your sleep. The calming ambience, the bespoke sleep aroma, and the privacy to truly relax and feel the difference. It's an experience that I would recommend to anyone who is serious about improving their sleep quality. For my UK listeners looking to transform their sleep and by extension their health, I encourage you to visit naturalmat.co.uk. And don't forget, being a Live Well Be Well listener, you can get 10% off your first order using the code LIVEWELL. Invest in your sleep, your health, and your planet with Natural Mat. I have to say, since recording this podcast in the last four years, it has entirely changed my view to resistance training. I was just a runner before that. Just, just doing a bit of yoga and a bit of running, which is great, but hardly any 
proper resistance training. And not even just for scarpini, even thinking for my mental health, all of the things that are mm -hmm. so important when it comes to resistance training. But something else that you, you just mentioned there about scarpopenia, which I wondered what your view was or if you've seen any research on this, only because it's such a big topic now and we've done quite a lot in the last season on the show, is menopause. So if we're thinking about that later date, with I'm just thinking about women in general, right? Women as we age, women are less likely to do resistance training than men. And I think as we age and we hit our menopause and we have our estrogen decline, that's also really affecting our bone health. Mm -hmm. So kind of those two things, especially as a woman ages, are quite key indicators on why resistance training is also quite important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we know that in that population, like the, the number of women that are regularly doing a resistance training or meeting the guidelines, which is kind of like two... 45 to 60 minute resistance training sessions a week is mm -hmm. is very low um mm -hmm. and as you say menopause at that at menopause that is a time where body composition begins to change mm -hmm. um, we see you know a reduction in lean mass we see increased adiposity particularly visceral and abdominal adiposity mm -hmm. some of that is probably mediated by changes in in hormones um, mm -hmm. and we we actually tend to see a reduction in energy expenditure. People are moving less. And the interesting thing is that's not something that people or women are cognizant of. If you speak to them, mm. they'll, they, they actually genuinely think they're still moving as much. But mm. the studies that have looked at this tend to suggest that they're actually, they are moving a little bit less. They're just not aware of it. Um, so it's not mm. to say that like they're lying or anything. Um, it's just kind of occurring subconsciously. And, and so we, we need to really encourage this group um, of society to really get involved in resistance training and encourage mm -hmm. them to get into the gyms and not feel intimidated because gyms have been a bit of an intimidating place for he many shape. of these women. If they remember, like if, if you're a 50, 55 year old woman today, then when you were in your twenties and thirties, you grew up in a very different time to today. How many women mm -hmm. were in gym, were, were in the gym lifting weights back then? Um, but even and, I feel intimidated going to a gym right. and I'm a young woman, you know what I mean? I'm not young woman, I'm in my thirties, but I mean, I've kind of grown up in a culture of going to a gym, but I still go there and watch guys lift weights and feel quite intimidated by being in the kind of yeah. that vicinity. Exactly. So like it's, it's still an issue now, um, but mm -hmm. it is, I think, starting to change. Mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see more and more women speak about the benefits of resistance training for mm -hmm. their physical health, but also mental health, yeah. as you mentioned. And, and I'm a big believer that like exercise, nutrition, sleep, you start here and then that allows you to really focus on mindset. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I agree with you. I think it's one of the best things you can do for your mental health is getting in and doing that workout. But mm -hmm. um, the other huge kind of health issue that can occur at menopause that resistance training can help attenuate is this loss of bone mineral density mm. and increased risk of of fracture. So we've been talking about resistant training as a stimulus to grow muscle, but it's also can be, a, it's a very good stimulus for increasing bone mineral density. You know, as the muscles contracting, there's force going through the tendon into the bone. It's pulling on that skeleton and mm -hmm. that causes the skeleton to adapt and, um, you know, lay, lay down kind of more bone tissue, um, which is really important because if you are, if you experience a hip fracture, for example, when you're in your 60s, and this is much more prevalent in women, and it's largely because of that big drop in estrogen, mm. um, we know that, that that significantly affects bone mineral density. But I, I would also say we're looking at this in a population who aren't resistance training, so I think you can attenuate it. But if you do have a hip fracture, then the, you know, um, the risk of kind of dying in the first 12 months and or even 24 months is, is extremely high. So mm. you want to be kind of early, as early in life as possible doing a resistance training to kind of build up the savings in your bank, you know, build up that bone tissue. Um, so you have more, you can draw on it a little bit more later in life and um, not run into and that's where balance. That's where the preventative measures come in because you just said that and that's how my grandmother sadly passed away from yeah. you know getting up to just get some mail and her hip went and three mm. days later she passed away and it's just so sad and to think you know in her day that wasn't 
resistance change was not even a thing. So mm-hmm. it is amazing that women are more talking about it. But something that I wanted to bring up here, because we're on the, kind of on a supplement with protein shakes, is creatine monohydrate. And I say that mm-hmm. as opposed to just creatine in general, because it's quite a topical debate at the moment. What are your thoughts on it regarding, or two things, performance and strength, but also kind of mm-hmm. cognition and cognitive functioning and the mental health side. I mean, they're two very like different sectors but there's an Mm -hmm. overarching conversation that resides in both of them. So what's your thoughts Mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, I usually think of of creatine, at least now, in three buckets. So performance, bone health, there's been some recent Mm -hmm. data on that. And then, as you say, cognition. Mm -hmm. The strongest data we have to support supplementation of creatine is for strength, hypertrophy, performance. Mm -hmm. And that's not really debated. So it might be topical, but like among academics, it's it's pretty clear. It's probably the most evidence-based, evidence-supported supplement out there um, mm-hmm. that we would classify as ergogenic, which is performance enhancing. That that is legal, I should add. Um, and the evidence suggests, you know, uh, for for that outcome, if you're someone that's just going to the gym and you want to improve your strength, then five grams, about five grams a day. Is the dose mm-hmm. and as you say there are different types of creatine out there but the most studied is creatine monohydrate many of these studies have used a type of creatine monohydrate called called crea pure which is mm-hmm. you'll see that logo on lots of different brands so that's that's pretty reputable that's a sign that they're using a kind of high quality creatine monohydrate mm-hmm. um at least it's tested for purity um mm-hmm. compared to maybe some of the other ones mm. so that's that's performance then there is uh, bone health. There's some interesting data that's come out of Darren Kandal's lab that's looked at, and this was in postmenopausal women, and they were looking at 0.14 grams per kilogram which, uh, of creatine per day, which roughly works out, let's say for a 70 kilogram woman, I think it's about 10, 10 grams of, of creatine per day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So double the dose of what would be kind of indicated for uh, hypertrophy or strength. And they looked across two years and they were looking at bone mineral density, bone geometry. The study wasn't long enough to look at fractures. So we're Mm -hmm. just looking at kind of um, the quality of the bone tissue at this stage. And he, they found there wasn't a change in bone mineral density, but there were changes in bone geometry, which suggested that bone is stronger. So we'll know a little Mm more, uh, but for now, what we know is that there are differences in, in kind of the architecture of the bone. Uh, so if you are a postmenopausal woman and you have osteopenia or, or low uh, or maybe osteoporosis or it runs in your family, then uh, that might be something that you want to consider adding. And also there's a lot of safety data suggesting that the adverse effects are r- quite uncommon and relatively minor. So the most mm. common one that someone would have is sort of some some mild gastrointestinal upset and that can be offset by splitting your dose so if you were taking Mm -hmm. five grams a day and you were getting that gi upset you could do half in the morning half night or if it was 10 grams half the morning half in the night kind of thing Um, Mm -hmm. and then cognition this is probably where the data at the moment is the weakest but mm-hmm. it, it is emerging and there, you know, there is a little bit of signal suggesting that supplementing with creatine, again, in the ballpark of eight to sort of 10 grams a day, um, maybe more in some context uh, can improve short-term memory and intelligence. Um, oh, wow. It's not that robust, but given the cost How? of creatine, given the cost of creatine, it's, it's the mechanisms aren't fully understood, but my understanding and what, what the researchers are saying is that it affects the ability, um, it affects your brain's ability to produce energy and to, to produce ATP essentially. Um, so that seems to be like the primary mechanism. Now, wow. I, I just want to add a caveat that we don't fully understand that. It's hard to do like creatine biopsies in people that are living uh, in their brain yeah. we can do it in muscle <laughs> tissue um so there's still a lot more to learn there but but what i would say is like when i'm thinking about oh, am i going to supplement with something number one is safety 
is yeah. there safety data on this for my kidney, my livers, my liver, my kidneys. <laughs> I was like, um, how many livers do you have, Simon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there safety data to suggest that it's not toxic, that mm -hmm. we're not doing any harm? You know, mm -hmm. do no harm, right, is the first yeah. approach. And we have so much data on creatines to show safety. So mm -hmm. that's a big tick. And then secondly, price. It's not an overly expensive uh, supplement, you know, because it's just kind of open to the market. There are so many brands selling it. It's a bit of a commodity. And then, you know, play around with it. So if if that if it is in your budget, you know, see how see how you feel. Are you getting any of these adverse side effects like the GI effects? Um, if you are, then it might be something that you want to split, like I said, or or not take. Um, mm -hmm. If you aren't and you feel good, then you might choose to to add it to your supplement regime and perhaps you'll get these benefits. Mm. That's really helpful. And I think talking about this before I move on, because there's so much to talk about in protein, is soy. Now, soy is a plant protein. Now, I loved, I had to bring this up because you pinned this on your grid and I found it so fascinating because currently I'm reading a lot about there's a higher rise than usual in infertility in men mm. for a whole load of reasons, environmental, I mean, huge loads of reasons, things that people probably haven't been tested for and now they're being tested, it could go on. But there's a lot of scaremongering and claims around that soy can make men more infertile. And I thought mm -hmm. it's so important to talk about this on the show because what I don't want people to do is start moving away from foods if there's no scientific evidence that this is what happens. So can you mm. give a bit of background? One on, should, should men be eating soy and will it give them moves? Which is one thing that I think a lot of men get scared about. And two, does it affect fertility in any shape mm -hmm. or form? And three, is it a good source of protein? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's, let's There we let's go, I'm laying this. them all let's, out. Let's do this in order of ease. So number three, yes, great source of protein. Okay, done. Uh, I think the video you're alluding to was a kind of response that I did to a video that Paul Saladino put out. Yes. My, my friend, Paul Saladino. Uh, so. Which I, mean, I loved you did this, discussion. by the way. This opens a huge discussion as to what is evidence, what is, is, um, good evidence versus other evidence that maybe we say is less reliable. How do we actually mm -hmm. come to a position on a particular nutrient or a food? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to, I won't broaden it too much. I'll let you pick and choose where you want to go. But the, the, the reason I did this video was that um, new, new and shocking information grabs our attention. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's not really Clickbait. surprising. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. we're hardwired to pay attention to that. It kind of makes sense mm -hmm. from a biological mm -hmm. point of view. You know, mm. there's there's not a whole lot of, of reason to spend energy thinking about things we already know from a survival mm -hmm. point of view it's something that's generating fear or shocking that's what we need to really be attentive towards mm -hmm. and so a lot of people putting out nutrition information on social media are, are kind of leveraging your evolutionary biology <laughs> and hardwiring um yeah so that's what i saw in this video was paul Paul was asked by someone else, you know, support your view that soy foods are feminizing and that they soy foods lead to infertility. Please show us the evidence. And so Paul did this video and he put up three pieces of evidence. Um, I know this intricately because I, I had to go back over and over and over because I couldn't believe this. Um, the first study was a, a rat study, so an animal study looking at soy isoflavones and mm -hmm. uh, how they affect um, sex hormones, so estrogen and testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, the, and then he, he put up a, a couple of, of human studies. One was this kind of cross-sectional observational study at a fertility clinic. Um, and then the third piece of evidence he put up was a study that fed people's, I think, soy protein powder compared it to whey protein and measured testosterone in just in the 30-minute period after they consumed it. Um, and so I went through each of these pieces of evidence and discussed them and said, 
you know, here are some things to think about, some problems with these, and also let's consider this within the context of the totality of evidence looking at this topic. Because it's very easy to grab some two or three studies to support your view, essentially cherry pick and discard or disregard a whole body of evidence. And you can mm -hmm. almost create a case to, to kind of demonize any food yeah, out you can. there. Um, yeah. So, you know, the first study, for example, that rat study, he, he flashes it up on the screen. It looks really compelling. He says here they fed soy isoflavones to these rats and they, you know, it lowered hormones. You know, and I dug into that study and it was very, very clear that actually in the soy isoflavone group, what they saw, and they explicitly state this, even in the abstract, was a reduction in estrogen and an increase in testosterone with the soy isoflavone um, consumption. So, you know, what, on social media, if you all you hear is that soy lowers hormones, right? But the actual mm. study is showing the opposite of what you would expect if we if soy was feminizing. If soy was feminizing, you would expect to see estrogen go up and testosterone down. Yeah. The study showed the exact opposite. Estrogen went down and testosterone went up. Now, I don't think we should put a whole... I don't think we should put a whole lot of stock in animal studies anyway mm. because of translation issues to human outcome data. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we have human outcome data, really animal studies interesting, but hypothesis generating at best. Um, and so I highlighted that just because I, thought, I found it very interesting that it seemed that he hadn't even really read that study and it refuted his own position. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that I highlighted was you know, we have clinical trials which are considered much more reliable and robust than observational data particularly cross-sectional observational data which is you know one point in time mm -hmm. if you it, observational yeah. data that looks at people prospectively over a long time is going to be more reliable than looking at someone at one point in time and trying to establish mm -hmm. a relationship between two variables mm -hmm. um we have we have uh, a sort of multitude of clinical trials that have taken men and fed them soy foods or soy isoflavones and looked at how that affects sex hormones, mm -hmm. how that affects sperm morphology. Um, mm -hmm. So like concentration of sperm, size motility, and shape. how they size, how they swim, um, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and, and these clinical trials go anywhere from two weeks up to 12 months, which mm -hmm. is important you know, I, I mentioned there that one of the studies he kind of flashed up was looking at soy protein and they, they measured things 30 minutes after consumption. They weren't looking at you know, two weeks up to two years, uh, two, two mm -hmm. weeks up to 12 months, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in all of these, this data where you actually feed people soy foods or soy isoflavones and you monitor sex hormones, you monitor sperm morph morphology, mm -hmm. you don't see any significant changes. Mm. Right. Um, so I, I think that this this whole demonization of, of soy is just it's just another example that you know, shocking information does grab our attention. When we hear something about you know, a food that we thought was healthy, all of a sudden it's not healthy. That's interesting. It gets clicks. Um, but we've really known this for I mean, I present all of that data, but then just go and look at fertility rates in Asian countries. Are they, are they dramatically lower because they consume mm -hmm. a lot more soy? I mean, that's a very mm -hmm. crude way of looking at it. That, that would be a high level way of looking at this and then zoom in on the clinical trials, which substantiate that. If you consume mm -hmm. soy foods within a diverse diet, and I'm talking sort of up to two to three serves of soy because that's kind of the amount of soy that was fed in these studies, two or three serves of soy a day uh, mm -hmm. or equivalent um, amounts of soy isoflavones that you would find in two or three serves of soy foods. If you're consuming them at that level, we don't see any deleterious effects. We don't see feminizing effects. We don't see a reduction um, in fertility and we don't see negative effects on sex hormones. So that set the record straight. I think that is just so important to mention because it's even a, in my family, some people are scared to touch soy because of this. And it's just scary when you actually think there's also a lot of benefits that come with these certain whole foods and that people are now fearing to try mm. them or use them in their diet because of what they're seeing online. And it takes me to like, you just mentioned there actually looking at Asian cultures and something that I personally 
have always been fascinated by, and I did my thesis on, was um, around omega-3 and fatty fish. Now, it's not kind of, it's not prominent at all in the plant-based diet, um, but it's something I, I speak about a lot, especially in regards to kind of mental health. Um, what's your thoughts on it? Because there's a lot of controversy now on people not consuming fish because of the mercury mm. levels, which I understand. But it comes at kind of a cost benefit of when we look at kind mm-hmm. of the outcome of what happens when you when you consume fish and also, you know, mm-hmm. the, the cost of doing that. And so for me, it feels very clear from, from, from research that I've looked at that actually having consumption of oily fish, one to two portions of week, is very beneficial. But I'd love to know what your thoughts are surrounding the mercury levels. And I'm taking out the environmental aspect of people not wanting mm-hmm. to do it because for ethical reasons, that's a completely different conversation but what's your thoughts on consuming one to two portions of fatty fish a week for Mm. your health benefits you kind of bring us to a really important point in terms of navigating misinformation online and another red flag which is overly focusing on mechanisms or a single Mm. effect and and not thinking about health outcomes Mm -hmm. We, we did touch on this before but you have to like think about fatty fish how many different compounds are in that whole food matrix Mm -hmm. and how many different physiological pathways in your body does that food affect Mm -hmm. okay so yes we've got to remember lots of foods even compounds there are pros and cons they might have Mm -hmm. a negative effect on a certain uh, part of our physiology but then have a whole kind of slew of positive effects and so the only way that you can determine what the kind of net outcome of that food is, is to look at health outcomes of interest. When mm-hmm. you consume that food, do we have lower risk of cardiovascular disease? Do we have lower risk of neurodegenerative disease? Uh, and Martha Morris from Rush University, who's done a lot of work on, or, or did a lot of work on dementia, I should say, uh, during her career, she actually looked at fish, fish consumption and risk of Alzheimer's dementia and at the same time you know she was looking at subjects that tracked over time and then they passed away and she was able to then look at the contents of mercury in their brain and her research showed that yes people that consumed more fish had more mercury in their brain that is Mm -hmm. that is a fact but they had less chance of developing Alzheimer's dementia so Again, that's what I care most about mm. um, is, is the actual health outcome. And I think you rightly pointed out that most people are not consuming the recommended sort of two or three pieces of, of fatty fish per week, mm. whether they're mm-hmm. omnivorous or, or not. Definitely not if you're following a plant-exclusive diet. Uh, so, you know, guided by health outcome data, I think the message to people needs to be to consume two or three pieces of fatty fish and mm-hmm. then um, whether someone wants to entertain the environmental kind of uh, part of that decision, that's a personal decision. Um, or if you're not going to consume two or three pieces of fatty fish per week such that you're not getting the enough of these direct um, sources of long chain omega threes dha mm-hmm. and epa particularly dha which is yeah. thought to be the why why fatty fish is protective against neurodegenerative diseases then you need to come up with another game plan mm-hmm. and uh, i did a huge like two hour long podcast with philip calder who's probably one of the the i guess most highly regarded scientists looking at omega threes and along with like bill harris And, you know, really we came to the conclusion that if you're not eating a fatty fish, well, you should be supplementing with DHA, EPA. Again, exactly how much, not clear, but uh, one gram a day combined of EPA, DHA is probably going to be a good starting place for most people. Um, And then if you were someone that was not consuming fatty fish and you didn't want to supplement, where does that leave you? Because often this is where people say, well, you can, you can just eat chia seeds and, and walnuts and flax seeds. And the reason for that <laughs> is that uh, there is a pathway in the body where we can take these um, short-chain polyunsaturated omega-3 fats 
and convert them into long chain. So you can take the omega-3s that are in walnuts and chia seeds and flax, and then the body can convert those to varying degrees between people and life stage to DHA and EPA. Now, your ability to do that is gonna be dependent on genetics, um, your BMI, like if you're overweight or obese, your conversion rate is lower. Mm-hmm. Um, and also your overall dietary pattern. So mm. this is where the omega-6 side of things becomes interesting because you know vilified, demonized omega-6s, people see them as pro-inflammatory, a whole nother discussion. Um, but I would say the one context where someone may want to reduce omega-6 consumption is this context, not eating mm. fatty fish, not supplementing with DHA and EPA, and they want to convert as much of the ALA omega-3s found in plant foods into DHA and EPA, Mm. then reducing omega-6s is is a good strategy because the the pathway that converts omega-6 linoleic acid right, to kind of longer form omega-6s shares the the same enzymes that facilitate that desaturation Mm -hmm. and elongation, they're shared. And when you have a whole lot of omega-6s in your diet, you're essentially using up a lot of these enzymes and that will lower your ability to convert plant found omega-3 fats into these DHA and EPA. So if you're someone Mm -hmm. who kind of, I would say is running the gauntlet, then that would be a strategy uh, for you. But uh, for everyone else, I don't think there's really a need to focus on omega-6s. I I mean, I, I completely agree. I think especially as our ratio, I think currently stands at 20 to one in the UK of the intake of MA6 to omega-3 when we think about it in that context mm. and sharing that enzyme it's really important to kind of think about getting in that fatty fish which is which is important and you, and you said something there about about supplements and the one thing I really wanted to mention um just because you do a lot of work in this area is actually just looking at the context of how much DHA and EPA is in that is in that supplement because the majority of supplements it's not full of that and that mm. is actually really important to try and look for like that 90% mark of having mm. the DHA and EPA in there is actually really, really crucial. Mm-hmm. And I get quite angry by looking at supplement market and thinking it's got 30% in there and the mm-hmm. rest is not full of that, of that fatty fish oil, which we really need. And then you're so, just consuming more supplements. <laughs> yeah, I like so, when I said I gr- one gram a day, like my personal view would be when you flip the label over, that you're getting at least that one gram from the DHA and EPA because it, mm. it'll say total omega and then usually under that it'll say DHA and EPA. So you don't want to see total omega one gram. You really want that DHA and EPA component to add up to at least one gram. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really glad we mentioned that. And when I think about this in the overall context, right, of what we're talking about, I know you get this asked this question all the time, but it is a question that I get asked all the time and I find it really hard to answer. But I quite like asking it in this way. So I think a lot of people might agree that the Mediterranean diet has been studied, spoken about a lot in terms of how we should be looking at our food plate and how we should be looking at the landscape of certain foods to include in our diet. And then if you think about Felice Jacker, um, who did the SMILES trial, and, and she's done a lot of kind of research around modifying the Mediterranean diet, which is having it at a, a much higher level um so eight whole grains a day um is including your diet all the fatty fish it's the mediterranean diet but increased a lot incredible outcomes that we see when we're looking kind of depression um and mental health but something i found really interesting when i was kind of looking a lot in your work and what you talk about a lot is the danish um Mm -hmm. the danish guidelines and i remember looking at these a while ago but you again you've pinned it very high up on your on your Instagram, mm-hmm. social media. And I was like, I'm really interested to see what Simon's got to say about this. And many of my listeners, I don't know if we've spoken about the Danish um, guidelines on here before. So I thought actually, rather than saying to you, what's the optimal diet, which is so hard because there isn't an optimal diet in my opinion. I think it's very much on that individual and having a diet that supports their lifestyle um, through certain themes that we can kind of, we know that are good for our health, which is just trying to stay away from ultra processed foods. When we're looking at the Danish dietary guidelines, what is different from then to the Mediterranean style 
diet that many viewers and listeners will will be very familiar with, but less familiar so with the Danish. Mm. I don't know that there's actually a huge difference. You know, I think mm. the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean diet, perhaps how people kind of see it and, and how the Mediterranean diet is defined in literature are two different things. Mm-hmm. And people might see it as lots of pizza and pasta and olive oil. And certainly olive oil is, is featured in it. But mm. it is a diet that that is really characterized by, compared to a standard Western diet, a diet that has less emphasis on red meat, particularly fatty cuts of red meat, processed red meats, has less emphasis on ultra processed foods. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, built, it's built upon the foundations of whole grains and legumes and fruits, and vegetables and nuts and seeds. There's fatty fish in there and olive oil. Like that, to me, that's a Mediterranean diet as defined in the literature. And mm-hmm. so when you hear like the Mediterranean diet is associated with great health outcomes, just remember like, that's that's how they're scoring the diet you know Mm. those foods that i just mentioned you get a higher score for and foods like you know red meat and alcohol and processed foods you get less score and so when people score higher on a mediterranean kind of diet index according to that they have better health outcomes the danish dietary guidelines for me is you know it's built it, it is built upon a lot of the research on the mediterranean diet and other kind of plant heavy dietary patterns. What I like about it is just the simplicity of how they put mm. it together. And there's mm. a, a PDF, I give you the link to the PDF. You know, I, I just think people, most people need to stress less about their nutrition. Mm. We're making it way more complicated than, than it mm-hmm. needs to be. There's fighting about low carb, high carb, you know, all of these things. And so I would say to people, just look at the, di- the Danish dietary guidelines. You can do it low carb, you can do it moderate, you can do it high carb. Get enough protein. We spoke about doing that. Minimize your consumption of ultra processed, hyper palatable foods. They make it hard yeah. to, to kind of get on top of our satiety and lead to um, weight gain, which is a very big risk factor for many of these conditions. Um, and then we can stop stressing and then use that extra bandwidth that you have because there's less anxiety about food. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that one. right? Yeah. Use that, that bandwidth to focus on exercise and exercising more consistently and with greater intensity. Use that bandwidth to uh, connect better with friends, to journal, to do breath work, like all these things that regulate the nervous system to you know, get in touch with how you're feeling and then think about yeah. the things that you want to take action on in your life that you're not like that's that's kind of like if i was coaching someone that's how i would set them up and say hey mm. you know these guidelines make it very simple we they're, they're built on the best evidence that we have they're mm-hmm. really sensible get these mm-hmm. in play and then in doing that you can kind of reduce your stress about food focus on all these other parts of our life that are really important I completely agree. I think every time I open social media as a nutritionist, <laughs> I'm just like, what is happening on social media? There is so much fear mongering. And the, bi- the one big one that I see, and I really just want to put it to rest a little bit, is on seed oils. Um, mm-hmm. We haven't covered it much on the show yet, but <laughs> it's, I think it's really important. And that's why I really want to make sure we do it today, is seed oils. Now, a lot of people are saying we shouldn't be having seed oils. They're going to cause chronic inflammation and, and all of that type of conversation. Um, my view is that it's just in a lot of ultra processed foods. And that's why we're having such a high consumption of these seed oils. Mm. Um, and actually that's where the fear should lie more if we're worried about what we should be taking out of our diet is removing those ultra processed foods because mm. majority of them are full of seed oils. What's your view on seed oils and you know, should we be mm-hmm. scared about them? Yeah, I think people are conflating seed oils with the consumption of ultra processed hyper palatable foods. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is, you know, people are consuming a lot of ultra processed hyper palatable foods. And as a result, we see these negative health outcomes, increased risk mm-hmm. of cancer, obesity, etc. And where I think people are going wrong is that they're attributing that to the seed oils that are in those foods. And those foods have many characteristics which lend themselves to poor health outcomes. Mm. Um, They are energy dense, 
they're hyper palatable, they're low protein, they're low fiber, <laughs> um, they're low in water and antioxidants, polyphenols, all of these things. And sure, they contain seed oils in there. That's part of the energy density. Um, but we have a ton of data looking at you know, actually feeding people linoleic acid. So linoleic acid is the primary omega-6 fat that's found in seed oils. So when people are demonizing seed oils, usually it goes hand in hand with saying that this omega-6 is inflammatory, like you said, um, it's obesogenic, and it's going to increase risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and where that stems from, my understanding of digging deep into this is that there is a pathway I mentioned before, the omega-6 pathway, where linoleic acid gets converted into uh, arachidonic acid. Um, and ar arachidonic acid acts as a kind of precursor to some inflammatory compounds. Um, so when you just look at that pathway on paper, you, you, could, you could kind of form this hypothesis that, okay, well, if you increase linoleic acid consumption, you're gonna raise arachidonic acid in the body. And then mm -hmm. you're going to have more of these pro-inflammatory um, kind of proteins produce. The problem with that is we have clinical data where you feed people linoleic acid and measure arachidonic acid. And guess what? The body holds ar arachidonic acid in a very, very tight range. It doesn't matter how much linoleic acid you consume. It doesn't go up. <laughs> so that's, that, that's the first thing to, to kind of understand. And there's clinical studies showing that. So if you want to say that linoleic acid is inflammatory, it's inherently inflammatory, then show some clinical data that supports that. Mm. Um, and then we have, and again, I think this is even more important, is let's go to health outcomes. One of the neat things about linoleic acid is that our body doesn't produce it. So mm -hmm. if we can measure it in the body in certain compartments, so in adipose tissue or in the blood, mm. we know that that has to have come in through diet, mm. right? It must come in mm -hmm. through, the, through diet because we can't, we can't actually synthesize uh, linoleic acid ourselves. And so that's, that's like a more reliable way of determining someone's linoleic acid exposure than asking them what they eat. Food mm. frequency question is a good and there's some that are better than others. But what this allows you to do is to actually have a, a biomarker that gives you insight into how much linoleic acid someone has been consuming. Mm -hmm. And there's huge studies done, uh, again, I'll share the links to these that have looked at linoleic acid content in phospholipids, in circulation, in adipose tissue, and then in these populations, depending on like the amount of linoleic acid in those compartments, what was their risk of cardi cancer, cardiovascular disease, total mortality. And if anything, what you see is that the higher the content of linoleic acid in these compartments, the lower the risk of these outcomes. Um, so again, if you're gonna take the position that linoleic acid is inflammatory, and leads to poor health, how do you explain that away? How do you explain the fact that people who actually have more of this in their body have lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of total mortality, essentially lower risk of dying during that study duration? Um, so, you know, you, ma you made the most important point at the beginning, which was mm -hmm. people are conflating seed oils with ultra processed foods. You know, certainly I'm not encouraging people to eat hyper palatable ultra processed foods. I just think that this kind of idea that seed oils are to blame for the, the problems that those foods pose is, is myopic, it's reductionist, and it's not really supported by the best mm. data we have. Mm -hmm. I think just having that kind of understanding for our listeners is so important because it's one of those things, it's that such a narrow perspective. And there is so much now in the nutrition space that if we can blame something, you know, it's quite easy to then put the, all of our health issues on that one thing. And mm. actually what it is, is it's kind of taking out the, the the 360 dimension of health, which is really important. And it's something that I said to you, I really wanted to speak to you about today. And this is something that I found being within the nutrition sphere is, you know, looking at our nutrients is fundamental for our health, but emotional health 
I think, mm. is really important. Just even how we consume our food, how we enjoy our food, how we connect with people over food, how we see ourselves is a huge thing. The perception we have on ourselves, the self-compassion we have with ourselves. Mm. And I feel like you've had a bit of your own journey in this um, because you kind of speak a lot about success in your early 20s. And then obviously you've, you've mm. learned and you, and you can just tell from speaking to you and all the work that you've done, you know, you're, you're so well researched. For you, it's so important to have so much scientific literature behind everything that you say. And it's just been throughout this entire show that you have just constantly, I don't know how you remember all of these, you constantly <laughs> reference studies and it's amazing. But such a big part of it as well for me is that kind of self-compassionate emotional element. What I'd love to hear just kind of your view on that when you're even just thinking about health and nutrition because I think it's a really overlooked aspect of health. Yeah, I guess none of this really matters if you're not in a good headspace, <laughs> to put it simple. Right. Right? So um, we just said that at the same time. Did we just become best friends? <laughs> we did. <laughs> uh you know i i kind of i certainly have been on this this journey myself and um you know i've got a lot of things wrong in my life mm -hmm. i'd like to think i've done some things right um the citation of evidence is probably something that i had drilled into me from my dad who's a professor of physiology so uh, anytime i would say anything at the dinner table or uh, in general conversation that's an, that's, a, that's an interesting view, Simon. How would you support that? <laughs> um, he would never shut my ideas down, but he would, uh, he would make me mm. deeply think about them. Um, and, you know, like many, I think I went through my 20s and was focused a lot more on kind of the, out, the outer world and less mm. on the inner world. Um, and I was happy. You know, certainly in my 20s, I look back and very fond of those years, but... Um, I think I got to a, a point where I realized if I want to like really squeeze the most out of this life, then, um, you know, going inward and getting a little clearer on like who I am, what are the things in my life that are, that are most meaningful, being really radically honest with myself. <laughs> um, what mm -hmm. do I like about what I'm doing? What would I like to do better without mm -hmm. like a lot of judgment, just realizing that we all have, uh, flaws and areas of our life that we can do better and mm. you know not judging but being accountable to those mm. things mm -hmm. and um, you know just just basically as I said earlier I use exercise I use sleep I use nutrition um, really just to kind of get me into a place where mentally I can now allocate time to journaling and meditation and breath work and, and gratitude and just cultivate more awareness. So I guess mm -hmm. I have just been able to introduce practices that cultivate more awareness. You know, I'd say in my mm -hmm. 20s, I was kind of on autopilot and my awareness of self was pretty low. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, eventually what happens is if you're not taking inventory on, on, kind of getting to understand your inner workings and, and um, checking in with yourself, then life gets chaotic. It leads to like low grade kind of anxiety and these things. So I, I think, you know, taking time to purposely slow down, it leads mm. to greater happiness. That's my learning. And then more product productivity when I do choose to hit the accelerator. So mm -hmm. my life in my thirties is, is much more, I kind of hesitate to say the word balance, but there's much more room carved out for slowing down. Mm. And then, you know, certainly still space to hit the accelerator and be productive with the, you know, the things that I kind of want to achieve. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of just been a, a process of, you know, something that I've learned over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's led to better relationships with friends and with family, still massive work in progress. Um, mm. but I feel like I've made my life kind of richer. What part was it that made you realize that? Because I know it, it sounds, for me, I basically, when I was in the modeling industry, had a, a basically a full body shutdown um, at 23, mm. <laughs> which 
which is it's, it's extreme but it, it made me actually look within mm. about what I wasn't doing um and I mean it was a very extreme process and then three months later my dad had a brain hemorrhage and it was mm. that was the bigger moment for me because I was in hospital and then he was in intensive care as well and the, and the surgeon said to him this is because of stress this is the reason why he's here and having my own kind of shut down body experience and habitual mm. burnout but I mean e- extreme like septicemia E. coli failed kidney I mean you name it I had it and then seeing my dad also shut down made me otherwise I probably would have never stopped and I wonder like is there something that happened in that Mm. early 20s for you that made you go actually I need to like look at myself a bit more because that's normally why it happens yeah I haven't spoken about this. <laughs> um, I obviously had an experience when I was a kid with my dad. I saw my dad have a heart attack, which was like mm. the initial seed that was planted. Um, you know, I thought I was going to lose him. He was taken by helicopter to the nearest hospital. Massive heart attack. They saved his life. Ironic because my dad is a professor of physiology and studies cardiovascular risk factors. Um, uh, and has done so for like 40 years and very well published in like leading journals. Um, but it kind of speaks to the fact that you can have all the information, but if you don't put it into practice, then you can't expect different results from the kind of average person out there. Uh, so that was like a, a pivotal moment in terms of, I think, inspiring me just to understand the human body a little more and, and how can we have more agency over our life? What, what mm-hmm. is in our control? What's not? Um, and sort of coming, coming to learn, you know, the, the importance of genetics, but really the importance of, of our lifestyle choices and um, how genetics are not destiny. That was like a really important thing for me to kind of learn early on in my twenties, which sort of, I guess, propelled me into all the things that I'm doing today. It gave me purpose. Um, but I think your question is more directed in terms of like when did I start to appreciate the emotional health piece because that was Mm -hmm. different Mm -hmm. for me i I said i was on autopilot most of my 20s it really took the breakdown of uh, a long-term relationship with my girlfriend who you know i think at the time uh, i saw a future with you know getting married Mm -hmm. having kids all the things Mm -hmm. and that relationship uh, broke down Mm -hmm. and um i don't think either of us kind of really saw that coming um, it, the, the kind of you know, outcome of that breakdown was me leaving where we were living. And so I lost touch with my community there. And mm. I guess I felt a little kind of isolated and lonely at times. Mm. And I shifted into a very negative mind, like mindset. Mm. And it took conversations with friends and one conversation in particular where, you know, someone just kind of put it to me really, really bluntly. Like your relationship broke down. You're dwelling on these things, but like, what are you accountable for? What are you responsible for? How could have you done better? How could have you showed up better? And, you know, it sounds like something that should have been intuitive and I was already really thinking about, but it's mm. easy to fall into the blame game. Mm. And, um, you know, that kind of just prompted me, I think, to kind of like realize like, the way out of this kind of slump and and to feel better is really taking ownership um, and learning from that and then being able to kind of do better and show up better in in relationships going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was kind of the on-ramp for me was, I guess, just being honest with myself and realizing the importance of that. Mm. I think it's the hardest thing to do, actually. Um... I honestly think it is the hardest thing to do because then you also have to somehow sit with compassion for yourself Mm. in those moments, which is an even harder thing to then not beat yourself up. And yeah, I don't know where you are on that journey now. Well, something that I kind of realized, which was like almost like a, the penny dropped was, you know, I was someone that was like very reluctant to kind of share how I was feeling mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'd bottle things up 
and avoid talking about a lot of things. And, you know, we all have these kind of personas or masks that we, we can put on. And, you know, I, I wondered, like, how many people in my life am I actually able to be myself fully around? That's a big question. And, <laughs> right? And yeah. if you think about that, like, if you can fully be yourself around someone, then you have to really trust them, right? There's a, there's a significant amount of trust there for you to show up as yourself. There's no persona or mask. Um, and, there, you know, being honest, there wasn't that many people. Mm. I felt like there was things that I would not speak about um, with even people that I would categorize as very, very close friends. And then the question becomes, well, if those people love you or say they love you, but you're not being yourself around them, do they really love you? Mm -hmm. Or are they just in love with some type of persona or mask? And then you go, shit, do I want to go through my life where people are not actually loving me because they can't see me? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in that. But, uh, but it's true. Yeah, I it's true. Think. I think it's really true. And, and, and then you, it's actually is like a really beautiful thing to kind of discover because you realize that – um, you know, the answer to this is being able to be more vulnerable, honest with yourself, honest with other people. And um, you're going to create much more meaningful relationships when people can actually see you and you feel comfortable for kind of being yourself around them. Mm-hmm. And that just actually does create a deeper relationship with the ones that you've already got. Mm-hmm. that's the kind of also full circle of it. Like the beauty of what you get out of those relationships is so much more because mm-hmm. you can feel exhausted half the time if you're masking who you are to fit a certain mm-hmm. window. But it's hard. You've got to go through that self-compassionate affair to get there, to not be mm-hmm. afraid of judgments, right? It, that's, a, that's a difficult totally. road. That's a mm-hmm. really difficult road. What's the yeah, one... The path of... The path of least resistance is to do what I did and a lot of people do for so long, which is just avoid. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's easier. Just, it's easier. In the moment, it's easier, but um, rarely does the path of least resistance lead to the the, the sort of more rich or greater outcomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there anything that's... that... I'm sorry, I can No, you go. I was going to say, was there anything that, that stood out for you? Because I think saying this... I mean, when I talk about this now, it sounds like it was a really easy journey for me. It was like 10 years of, of, of actually a lot of learning and a lot of growth and a lot of pain and, and a lot of vulnerability. Was there anything that stood out for you that helped you in that? I mean, it, it's a ama- first of all, like amazing friend, by the way, that stood out and said to you, have you mm-hmm. looked at yourself? Have you done these things? Because that's quite hard to do as a friend. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're quite worried about what you might come up against. So amazing that someone did that and that feels like a true friend. But was there anything mm. that kind of stood out for you that you were able to go and do that? Because the fear mm. is still there, even when we figured this out. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I think the, the journaling piece has been really important mm. because for a few reasons. One, I can just get really clear on um, my current perspective, how I'm seeing things. Um, but I can, you know, someone kind of gave me this advice of like you know you're when you're wanting to work on yourself and improve areas of yourself it's important to acknowledge the parts of yourself that you love because as you said earlier you can just this can become tiring and you can beat yourself up and we all have flaws and things to work on so mm-hmm. i think that the journaling process and allocating time to like yeah sure i want to like improve aspects of my life i'm committed to that for the rest of my life um, mm-hmm. But because I'm committed to that doesn't mean I'm broken or flawed. There are a bunch mm-hmm. of things that I really love about my life that I think I do well. And I want to kind of highlight and emphasize those to myself along this way. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, just drawing awareness kind of eagerly to those things throughout that, it makes it, I don't want to say more comfortable, but it's you're less likely to kind of just fall into this place of self-hate right and so you have like in in order to have these conversations and be vulnerable like you don't have to like 
you don't have to like fully love everything about yourself, but there needs to be no. some degree of of self love. Right? Hugely. And and so, uh, yeah, I think I, I think, think just, otherwise just, it's demotivating, right? If you don't have self love, yeah. like why would you want to change? Like if you're being demotivating to yourself every day, self critical every day, it's the opposite mm-hmm. of motivating. And I did a talk last night on this, and I. I'd actually love you to do something after this show. And it's to contact, it, somebody said this to me and it was really fascinating, to contact three friends and ask them to write 10 things that they love about you and then to open it a week later and like mm. keep that for a reminder on your phone because there might be things mm-hmm. on there that's really shocking for you um, that mm-hmm. you might not realize and how people see you. But it's a really nice thing to actually receive, which how often do we ever ask anyone who we kind of really care about to say 10 things mm-hmm. that they love about us? It's like a really beautiful thing that you can actually kind of reflect back to in those moments. Mm-hmm. I, I will report back. Can you report back? So mm-hmm. Simon, that leads me to my final question, which I wonder if it's gonna be in your answer to this. Um, but it's what does live well, be well mean to you? Mm-hmm. I think it means you know, having the spiritual, mental, physical health to show up in this world as your best self and mm-hmm. being able to, to impact the world and people around you in positive ways. Mm-hmm. And you know, many of the things that we've kind of discussed today feed into that or help you you know, cultivate that that true, um, holistic approach to health. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's about you know being being healthy from a, a spiritual sense, understanding my kind of place in this world, mm-hmm. being healthy um, from a, a mindset perspective. The things I'm saying to myself, the inner critic. Getting, getting on top of that mm-hmm. um, and then being physically able to do the things I, I want to do. But it really comes back to to the impact that I'm having on people around me um, and, the, and the world. And, you know, um, I think there's no, there's no shortcut to kind of achieving that. If you just focus mm-hmm. on nutrition or you just focus on, on exercise, you know, one of those things is going to slide. 100%. Yeah. It's a beautiful answer. And it's, not it's not same to any other one we've had before and 200 episodes you've never had one similar answer which i just think is like the beauty of that question of Mm -hmm. what it means to people um but i love that so much of it is about kind of with others being with others Mm -hmm. and um and that connection simon thank you so much i want to make sure that before we go you mention about your fantastic initiative that you've done the living proof challenge which is free You've done it with Rich mm-hmm. Roll, which is also bloody amazing. Um, and it's zero cost. So it's one of these things mm-hmm. that it's not high cost price. It's not elitist. But can you please really just quickly give us an overview about it, where people can go and download it, where they can kind of sign up to the challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and we will also put all of this in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so high level, um, I wanted to create a, a framework for people that allowed them to optimize their lifestyle for longevity. And it Mm -hmm. covers emotional health, covers cardiovascular or cardiometabolic health, musculoskeletal, um, a bunch of things, cardiorespiratory. And this was built um, based on kind of observations that if you look at the longest living populations in the world, they Mm -hmm. don't really have, they don't have greater willpower than, than us. They just happen to live in an environment that is conducive to longevity Mm. it's very easy to make the healthy choices in those environments and in those cultures understanding that we live in a very different environment and so we have to be more intentional in order to get the same outcomes because our Mm. environment is in many ways kind of uh set up for us to fail you know the the you know, I liken this to kind of a maze versus a labyrinth. So a maze is very much designed to confuse you and get you lost, whereas a labyrinth 
is actually more of a mindfulness type of exercise where you there's only one way in and it, you know you walk and there's there's no right and left turns the, you just walk and you'll get to where you need to go mm-hmm. and these long living populations live in a labyrinth the labyrinth whereas we are living in a maze so we need mm-hmm. help as we're going through that maze like a little voice saying turn left turn right and that's what the this longevity the living proof longevity challenge is about there's really three main things so we we test what matters at the start so we so what are things that we can actually test which act as windows into longevity mm. that are relatively accessible and not super expensive we call those the 10 truths so everyone measures those at the beginning they put them into our longevity calculator they get a longevity score at the start then there's a 12 week program and these are evidence based interventions that we know will act on those 10 truths. So we can Mm -hmm. start to shift them into a more favorable direction. And then at the end of the 12 weeks, you retest and you see how your longevity score has changed. And hopefully throughout the process, you've started to build some of these new habits into your lifestyle. Mm, Okay, amazing. And it's, it's, is it, do you have to do blood tests? This is the one thing I was interested in about when I was looking at this, because mm-hmm. I think some people might think, oh my gosh, do I have to do blood tests? Or can they do it without blood tests? What's your, what's the kind of um, protocol mm-hmm. regarding the, the 12 weeks? And so some that? of the 10 truths are blood biomarkers, uh, but you can do the 12 week challenge without doing the, the pre and post testing. I recommend the pre and post testing, particularly the pre, uh, because what you measure, you can optimize. So yeah. understanding where your baseline is at is helpful because you might have two out of the 10 truths that you need to focus on a little more. Mm-hmm. And therefore in the 12 week challenge, the interventions that address those might be things you lean into more. Mm-hmm. So kind of understanding your baseline is helpful when it comes to intervention and how you set up your lifestyle. And then mm-hmm. the post testing I, I think it's really motivational to see the changes because people, you know, we're getting lots of people right now heading towards the end of the 12th week. So they're about to do their testing. Um, it can be very motivating to see these things shift. Mm. And if mm. you're following, even loosely following what we're putting forward in the 12 weeks, you don't have to be perfect. Just be mm-hmm. consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, then you will see changes for sure. Mm. Amazing. Well, we're going to pop that all in the show notes and so I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours um but thank you so much for coming on I would love to have you on again there's so many things that we'd love to talk to you more about Mm -hmm. thank you I know um all the time and effort that goes into producing a show so I appreciate you amazing thank you so much (laughs) 